Hello, and welcome back to Break the Twitch, the podcast about doing more of what matters through minimalism, habits, and creativity. I'm your host, Anthony Ungaro. Joining me in this episode is my friend Sarah Von Bargen, who runs the website Yes and Yes because yes is more fun than no is the tagline. And she is an online entrepreneur, a creator, a writer, and has done lots of amazing things. And in this conversation, we talk about habits, we talk about morning routines, evening routines, we talk about money, the stigma of income and sharing our actual income numbers. There's a lot of great stuff to take away from this conversation, and I'm very excited to share it with you. And of course, this episode is brought to you by the Break the Twitch member community, which I would love to invite you to be a part of. You can go to breakthetwitch.com community to learn more about the audio courses, the live Q&A sessions, and of course, the private Slack channel mastermind that you can join and share ideas, ask questions, all that kind of good stuff with other community members and myself. If my work with Break the Twitch has been helpful to you, I would absolutely love and appreciate your support. Go to breakthetwitch.com slash community to find out more about joining and all of the awesome benefits you'll get. But for now, let's start the show. Sarah, how are you doing today? I am great. Thank you, Anthony. That's great. Thanks for, <laughs> thanks for joining for the podcast. Oh, gosh. Thank you for having me. So when we met up for the first time, what was I, I'm trying to remember exactly what the circumstance was. Did we meet through? Grant Spanier um, yes. suggested that I check out your stuff. And then I'm not sure if I reached out to you. Maybe I linked to you. I don't remember. What I do remember is we were supposed to meet somewhere and I had like inexplicably somehow like locked my car in the garage, which seems like that should be impossible to do. <laughs> I somehow managed to do it. And so I think I emailed you and I was like, you just want to come over to my house because I can't <laughs> drive anywhere. Yes. And so it was awesome because I feel like it sort of like immediately up leveled our friendship because it was like, Instant. come into my house. I know we've never met. Here is my dog who barks too much. Here is my enamel kitchen sink that's sort of stained with coffee. You know, it was yes, very, perfect. it was like next level friendship immediately. Yes. And I do remember that. There yeah. is something magical about mm. just going over. A lot of the time yeah. it's like, hey, let's meet for coffee. Yeah. And you yeah. often end up going and doing that, mm -hmm. spending money, things like that. Yeah. Which is fine. But yeah. uh, there is something really intimate and mm -hmm. personal about when you feel safe to do it and mm -hmm. that kind of thing. Yeah. You have enough reference points that, yes. that you can yeah. get through yeah. it. So you're here in Minneapolis. And yeah. uh, how long have you been here living here? I think. Um, I think I would say on and off for like eight years. I travel a lot, um, sometimes for like huge chunks of time, like 10 months or six months. Mm -hmm. um, but on and off for about the last eight years. And now um, I'm married and my husband has sort of a forever job here in the Twin Cities. So I will be here for the next probably 20 years. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Have you personally experienced some of those kind of like, how do you deal with the winter? Do you like it? Do you not like it? Well, I would say like, I enjoy winter, like November through like January 15th. <laughs> and from January 15th onward, I am over it as I imagine most Minnesotans are. Um, I think it definitely, I mean, for me, it has forced me to be incredibly intentional about like, how I spend my time, where I get my energy, because I think for a lot of us and for myself previously, like when it's dark all the time, when it's cold all the time, sort of the default is like stay inside, eat carbs, watch television. <laughs> and that yeah. doesn't necessarily feel great for me. And it doesn't necessarily put me on a path towards the life that I want. So I've probably had to work harder than maybe somebody who lives in like California thinking about like what works for me, what fills me up, how can I feel good when it is negative 40 degrees? Right. So it's really forced me to sort of, um, build an intentional life because when it is snowing six months a year, <laughs> you can't just sort of rely on your default go-to habits because they might not serve you well. Yes. And here's a fun fact about yeah. negative 40 degrees. <laughs> when I moved to Minnesota, so I grew up in Michigan mm -hmm. and we had pretty yeah. wintry winters yeah. there, but mild 
compared to many winters mm-hmm. here. The first week that I arrived was the first week of January. Oh my gosh. And there were three days in a row where the wind chill temperature was negative 40 oh degrees. Oh my God. Were you like, what have I done? It was really cold. And mm-hmm. fortunately there haven't been too many bad ones since yeah. then, but I tried to do that thing where we were in a high rise Ooh, and yeah. I had boiling water and I was oh, going to yes. throw it out the the window yeah. to <laughs> to make it snow yeah. basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the sliding door is frozen shut. Oh my god, that is that is that's like a plot point in a short story. <laughs> that's, that's symbolic so good. in so many yes. ways. No, no yeah. fun for you. <laughs> Absolutely not. Oh my god, not. I love it. Uh, so how did you get into to doing what you do now? Oh gosh, and, that's a great question. And what was like, I'm always curious because I know you're a writer, mm-hmm. you're creating just amazing things and you're creating courses that help mm-hmm. people with like money and mm-hmm. happiness and just being present. Mm-hmm. Um, how did you get into this stuff? Like oh, where did it come from? I would say sort of two things. I have a background in writing and marketing. I've been writing, I've been getting paid to write since I was 20. Um, and I started reading blogs and when I, I had been living abroad, I moved back to America. I needed a creative outlet. I'd been reading blogs for a long time. I knew how to write. And I thought like, I know how to do this. I could do this. And there was stuff that I wanted to read that I couldn't find on the internet. So I thought I'm going to write the blog that I want to read because I imagine if I want it, other people will want it. And I sort of inadvertently lucked into a hole in the market, I guess. (laughs) And also I've been blogging for 10 years. There are 2000 blog posts in my archives. Like it's just, you know, it's a numbers game. If you write enough stuff, eventually people are going to listen to you. Um, but in terms of like being present and like managing your money with intention and like creating a life you want on the income you already have, I would say that honestly, a lot of that comes from um, the way I was raised. Uh, my parents are Public school, they were public school teachers for their entire careers in a low-income school district mm-hmm. in the second poorest county in Minnesota. Um, as we all know, public teachers, public school teachers don't make a ton of money, but we had a really great life on, you know, my parents' salaries. Like we lived in a three-bedroom house on a lake. We took vacations every summer. Like I was a foreign exchange student to Germany. Like I had opportunity, you know, I, I had a really nice life. And I could see the other teachers in the school district often had like second jobs and my parents never talked about it. They weren't like, you know, we manage our money wisely, so we don't need to work in the summer, but I could just see it. Like I could see that, okay, Mr. Maddlemackey also is a bartender at the golf course. Why isn't my dad have a second job? And as I got older, I sort of was able to realize like, oh gosh, like my parents are able to afford this life and only work one job because of other choices that they've made. Like most of the food we eat is literally an animal that my dad killed (laughs) or from our garden. Like we heat our house with wood that my dad cut down himself. Mm. And, you know, we don't go out to eat very often, but because of those of not doing those other things or making choices, we were able to travel every summer. So A lot of the work that I do is around intentional spending and aligning your spending with your values and your happiness. And mostly it's just because I was raised that way. My parents never spelled it out to me. They never said like, we can afford to take a one month road trip because we're eating food from the garden and heating our house with wood. But I realized eventually that's what was going on. And so I've sort of worked backwards to take those lessons and make them approachable and accessible to everyone, regardless of your income or your situation. Because obviously not everybody <laughs> can cut down trees on acreage that they own and eat their house. That's not on the <laughs> table for everybody. My 40 40 front, foot front yard. Like, yeah, that's not, that's not on the table for you. But so I've sort of worked backwards to create um, lessons and teachable stuff that can help anybody apply that sort of mindset and creativity and intentionality around their spending. Was there a point when you had a realization about your parents and the way you were raised and that sort of thing and how it related to this or like, or like, was it sort of just a, it kind of made sense to you by the time you grew up and what was going on? I didn't realize that the way I navigated money was different than anybody else. Um, 
And for a long time, so I taught ESL abroad. I moved back to America and I was teaching ESL at a nonprofit. So you guys just think about how much school teachers make and then imagine a teacher at a nonprofit, like even less. Yeah, okay. So I had, I was not making very much money and I had $50,000 worth of school debt. And I was paying like $375 a month in school loans. I did not have a lot of discretionary income. But with the discretionary income I had, I lived in a cute apartment in a, I lived in Cathedral Hill in a really nice neighborhood. I still took trips. I still traveled. I still, you know, got regular compliments on like how cute my apartment was and how cute my clothes were. And I was just, you know, spending with intention and I just thought it was normal. And what it sort of clicked for me is I heard through the grapevine that sort of a friend of a friend who knew of my online presence had said, had asked if I had a trust fund <laughs> or like Perfect. wanted and, and wanted to know like how I could possibly afford this life. And this, this person was like, I don't buy it. I don't buy that she works at this nonprofit and that she's like traveling all over and you know, like she dresses like that. And, and like this person didn't believe that it was possible. Yeah. And so that sort of made it click for me. Like, if I am doing something that appears to be impossible and totally implausible to strangers, I'm doing something different. Mm -hmm. Like if, if I'm doing something that makes people think I have a trust fund, which I so deeply don't have a trust <laughs> fund, then that sort of, that was sort of the thing that made me be like, Oh, I guess I'm doing something different than what other people are doing. If strangers on the internet think I have a trust fund. This reminds me so much of the concept of aligning action with values. Yeah. So putting your action where your values are mm -hmm. and then not, not letting it creep into other things. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Which is easy to do yeah. oh with my your gosh, attention. Yes. Right. Yeah. Yeah. On a day to day basis. Mm -hmm. Like I'm so curious, mm -hmm. what does this look like for you on mm -hmm. a day to day basis? Yeah. And maybe it's so natural at this point that it's just kind of like, duh, this is just mm -hmm. how it works. But if someone's starting out and they're wanting to kind of explore putting their money mm -hmm. towards the things that are going to actually bring them happiness yeah. versus not wasting it otherwise, yeah. what would that kind of look like? Well, the first step that I always tell people, and this seems incredibly obvious, but you need to figure out what makes you happy first. And some people yeah. are lucky enough to be like, oh, I know. And they can list off like 20 bullet points of like the following things make me happy. Um, but I would say a lot of us, I would say maybe like 70 to 80% of us don't actually know what makes us happy. Or we can say off the top of my head, X, Y, Z makes me happy. But if we really stop and think about it and we think about the last time we did X or Y, was it truly happy making? Um, so I say the, the best first step that you can take is figuring out what makes you happy. And how I tell people do that is just using your phone. Next time you find yourself in a moment where you're like, oh my gosh, this is great. Like this is, I'm so happy right now. It's really nerdy. Literally make a note in your phone, <laughs> use your notes app. I have a list in my phone of things that make me happy. Um, so take note, notice it. Um, think about things that you loved when you were a kid, like back before you were concerned about like, is this monetizable? Do pe what do people think about this? Like, is this age appropriate? Am I good enough to go pro? Like the things that you just liked doing cause they were fun mm -hmm. because it is very likely what you liked when you were 10 years old, you will still like the adult version of that. Like I still love dancing. I still love singing. I still love doing sort of crafty things. And I loved that when I was 10 and I loved it before I got consumed with like dance practice and like, where am I in the lineup? Am I dancing at the front of the dance team or not? You know, because sometimes stuff can kind of get spoiled. Like you love playing baseball and then you're on the varsity team and then you injure yourself and the coach is a jerk and he kind of spoiled and you give it up. And then you give it up for your whole life without realizing like, Hey, you're 35. You can just join a rec league and it's going to be fun again. And have a blast. Yeah, totally. Because you're not going to have some coach riding you about like, if you make it to state. Right. <laughs> so, right. so that's where I tell people to start is figuring out what makes you happy. Um, and the other big thing, and this is honestly kind of a lifelong practice is unpacking what actually makes you happy versus what makes your friends happy, what makes your neighbors happy and what your parents believe should make you happy. And it's definitely, um, a process and it's not something that you like 
figure it out and then it's solved for the rest of your life. It's like, so this isn't actually about money, is it? Yeah. (laughs) It's 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 sort of, there's, there's there's so much, so many of us, um, act from a place of, we, we navigate life through default. Um, and we replicate behaviors that we see other people engaging in. So like, when everybody you know goes shopping when they're depressed, it's really easy to fall into that as well. When everybody you know owns a Vitamix and you're perfectly happy with your like ninja, but everybody else owns a Vitamix, it's really easy to feel like I'm, I would actually be way healthier if I had a Vitamix. In reality, your smoothies may be slightly smoother at, to the tune of four hundred dollars. <laughs> you know, so it's it's really it's hard to distance yourself from what makes other people happy. And and the other thing that I tell people is don't be too hard on yourself because it's like, if you don't know anyone else in your life who's doing X, Y, or Z, it can be really hard to sort of realize that it makes you happy. Like this is a very strange parallel to draw, but I love tiny things. Uh (laughs) I love miniature things. No one else in my life likes that. I don't see it represented anywhere, like on the internet. No one else in my life is like, I like tiny things. So like it weirdly took me a while to realize like, oh my gosh, every time I'm in like a gift store and there's like a tiny, a tiny statue of an animal, I love it. Like it can be really hard to figure that out if you don't see it represented anywhere. If everybody in your life loves riding their bike and going to brew pubs, it is very easy to convince yourself that you also like riding your bike and going to brew pubs. you're totally into that thing. Maybe you're like kind of into it it so it's it can be really hard to figure out what makes you happy when you don't see it anywhere in your life or anywhere in movies or anywhere on tv i totally resonate with this when i first again going back to when i first moved to minnesota i didn't really know anyone i had some Mm -hmm. guys in the group of friends that amy had met here already Mm -hmm. but a bunch of them started playing golf Mm -hmm. and and okay i was like well they're playing yeah. golf and it's, I, I want to hang out with them with these yeah. people and hang mm-hmm. out. Cause I like them yeah. and I want them to like me too. Yeah. And so I got golf clubs, yeah. started playing golf several times a week yeah. for quite a while, like mm-hmm. six months a year. Yeah. And then it kind of faded out and people started moving away over the years. Mm-hmm. And, and I still have my golf clubs at this point mm-hmm. and I'm listing, I'm pretty sure I'm like listing them now. Cause yeah. I haven't played in a while. Yeah. And I realized it was like, I like being outside. Yeah. Yeah. But I think I was really doing that because of the potential social connection that did pay off in amazing friendships over the last 10 years and stuff. So there is this fine line, right? Between figuring out, uh, what are the things that I was Mm -hmm. doing? Cause would I go out and do it now? No. Yeah. Yeah. And it took me realizing like, Oh, no one around me plays golf anymore. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and I, and I would never, I don't want anyone to reach the point where like, your friend asks you to do something and you categorically say no to everything that wouldn't doesn't 110% no, 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 no. Yeah. right light you up. If you're like lukewarm on something that costs you like 20 bucks every two weeks, and let's say what you really love is going to different restaurants around your city trying to find the best barbecued ribs, you could get a lot more, you could get like 100% unadulterated joy doing something that you 100% love. Or something that's sort of lukewarm. And again, not to say that you shouldn't ever do stuff with your friends that you're not, you know, you can do stuff that you're occasionally lukewarm on. But like if it's costing you hundreds and hundreds of dollars a year, maybe like cut it in half. Right. Cut your losses and, you know, go half and half. Or invite your friends who you normally go golf with to go find the best barbecued ribs with you. Finding that balance. Yeah, Because you don't want to just shut, be like, oh, I'm sorry, but I don't. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't 100% light me up. I'm not going. (laughs) Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I'm sorry. This is not perfectly aligned mm-hmm. with my happiness yes. index. So yeah. next time, maybe I would say 95% of the time when your friends want to get together, it's just about hanging out. It's the it time. is, it is rarely, I mean, I have a few friends who like they're, they love going out to eat and they love like, we're going to go to Martina cause it's been getting great reviews and I got us a great table, Sure, but the vast majority of my friends just want to hang out because they haven't seen we haven't seen each other for a while. So what I try to really do, or or I take initiative, like, oh, I haven't seen Lindsay. I'm gonna reach out to her and I'm gonna say, like, do you wanna grab a coffee and walk around Lake Nokomis? Because mm-hmm. that costs three dollars instead of going out for lunch. Yeah. And also, like, it feels nicer to walk around. And also, like, if you're gonna have, like, if you haven't seen somebody for a long time or you wanna catch out a, catch up about a specific topic or they're going through something, 
um, like studies have shown that um, walking, like facing the same direction together, people um, feel more comfortable discussing vulnerable topics than like looking deep into each other's eyes because it can be sort of overwhelming. Absolutely. And also like, I mean, we've all had the experience you're sitting in a coffee shop and like a couple's breaking up next to you or, or like talking about like- Someone's a, getting a, like a job yes, interview. Yes, yeah. Next to like you, it's yeah. just, it can, if you're going to have a vulnerable conversation and you're walking someplace, you're not, you can be more vulnerable because you're not sitting next to the same person for an hour and a half while they listen to you like unload about your yeah. health diagnosis. That's true. You're 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 giving little lots of people little bits that they probably can't use. It's like yeah. an encrypted <laughs> and they're not gonna be like, conversation. What? Right? Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Exactly. That's very smart, and mm-hmm. I I love that idea too. I've been doing that increasingly mm-hmm. with meetups with friends, yeah. things like that. Mm-hmm. Going, hey, let's go for a walk. Let's yes. go for yeah. It's much nicer. Just do that. It's, yeah, it's and great. I think that. I, what I have encountered is a lot of people appreciate it because it takes, I have taken the expectation of them to plan anything and whether they are watching their spending or not, most people appreciate a situation where they spend less. Yeah. Or are yeah. forced, aren't yeah. forced to yes. spend more. Oh, totally. Yeah. They're not like, oh, you want to go out for dinner and you've already made us a reservation at La Brasa. I guess I'm spending $40 now. <laughs> Yeah. It's just, it's, and also again, like I think having someone over to your house is a much more int- intimate than, um, than, you know, meeting at a coffee shop. So I know that you have a list mm-hmm. and this is something that I've been following closely because I am actually interested in doing something similar, mm-hmm. like this idea of a what matters list. Mm-hmm. And I know that mm-hmm. you focus on a list of things that you want to bring into your life, like new mm-hmm. experiences, mm-hmm. things to try. Yeah. What inspired you to start that? Oh gosh. Well, I think I actually started it um, in my 29th year because, you know, when you're turning 30, it's a huge milestone and it's very like, what am I doing? Yeah. Where am I? <laughs> yeah. What am I doing? Who Where is I? this going? Is this what I planned? Yes. Yeah. yeah. And so, and also, um, I had just, I had been living abroad for seven years and I moved back to America when I was 29. And so the combination of turning 30 and like sort of the, the shock, the culture shock of moving back to America, those things combined to make me think like I need, I need something to sort of move forward and help me also feel, um, engaged with my life because living abroad living, especially someplace where you don't speak the language, like it challenges you on a daily basis and everything is new all the time. And then to move back to a city where you'd already lived and you had tons of friends, it's not the same. Um, but yeah, it's the new things list is I recommend it to everyone. Um, it has been shown that time, um, emotionally and psychologically slows, when you're doing new things, and I'm sure we've all had this experience, you go on vacation and it's a week, but it feels like it's three or even just like taking a day trip to a new city that you haven't been in. Like it, it feels good in my brain. Like I can feel the synapses being like, Ooh, 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 what's happening. Oh, look at that thing. Um, I also have found that for what, when you have a list of new things and your friends know about it somewhat, like maybe you would feel weird saying to a friend, like, do you want to take a tightrope walking class with me. But if you say it's on my new things list for whatever reason, it it gives me more, um, it makes me feel braver. Yeah. It's like more permission almost to just ask. It's like, I'm just doing this. It's on my list. I have to do it. Um, and so I've done, and it really strengthens your friendships when you're doing these really novel things with people like, um, last winter, a group of like 12 girlfriends and I took what is this? It's on the ice and you're polishing it with a thing. Do you know uh, what I'm talking about? Um, it's it, like, it's the, it's, it's like the Canadian Olympic bowling. Yes. Are you like, <laughs> <laughs> it's bowling on, uh, the stones. The broom. Yes. Yes. And the brooms that thing. curling. Yes. That's what it is. Yes. <laughs> so like 12 girlfriends and I took curling classes <laughs> and it was so fun and funny and hilarious and like a great memory. Yeah. Like another girlfriend went with me to a bird watching class. Like I've done so many fun, weird things and it really strengthens your friendship when you experience this new thing together and you can say like, Oh my gosh, do you remember when we were at the bird watching class and they told us about this? And then the old lady said that like, it's so much more, again, it like deepens your friendship and sort of moves it forward rather than just like sitting in a coffee shop and being like, so what's up with work? If you both are new and you're like, Oh my God, I don't know how to hammock camp. Did you get yours tied on? Right. Oh my God, I'm falling out. You know, like it's hilarious. You're being vulnerable with each other. You're both like helping each other figure it out. 
again, so much better than getting cocktails. Mm -hmm. Like it's just hilarious and fun and vulnerable and it's great. I totally recommend it. So what is another example of something off of this list that you've either done recently or you're looking to do? So I make a new list every year on my birthday. My birthday's at the end of August, so I need to hurry up and finish this one. Mm -hmm. I would say the three things that I'm working on right now are um, going hammock camping. So I've never done that. Yeah. <laughs> um, take a ropes course. Um, and I feel like I have a lot of friends who'd be like, yeah, I mean, I could probably find like 15 people who would very joyfully do this with me. And then the last one is... Um, so I'm vegetarian and there, I want to learn how to make vegan bacon. And there are like three different sort of go-to recipes in regards to vegan bacon. And I have several other friends who are vegetarian. So I want to invite them over. And the plan is we're going to each make one of these recipes and then we're going to have a taste off. There you go. It'll be like these two recipes. And then I'm also going to buy morning star farm breakfast strips. And we'll have a, t a taste off. Breakfast strips. Yeah. I, those are my go-to fake bacon, but... And I might also, I mean, I do occasionally eat real bacon. I don't know if my friends do, but I think it'd be really good to have like a three homemade versions, the store-bought fake version and real version. Right. But I don't know if they would eat it. But yeah, so those are three of the things. And I also, when I do these, I try to think of things that are like completable in a day, mm -hmm. not something that requires like training. Like I'm not running a marathon. These are things that you can like, you register for and then you do or something. Okay. And so that's one criteria yes. is like... Keep it relatively, it's relatively simple, easy. experiential. Yeah. yeah, and I try to keep it under fifty bucks. When if there's something that's expensive, it's like one thing that exp that's expensive because I do twenty five, and I don't want to be doing like twenty five hundred dollars worth of new things. So you you have to be basically one every two weeks. To yeah, it's, keep on it's track. not. <laughs> I mean, <sighs> I've never completed all twenty five, and that's okay though. Yeah. I feel like yeah, it's totally like nobody's looking at it and being like oh, went. And I also try to do, uh, there should, I always try to do one or two that are like food based, like try this thing or make this thing. One or two that are about watching movies or reading a book that everybody else has read that I haven't. So some are, oh, so yeah. some new things are so easy and like probably laughable. And you're like, Sarah, I cannot believe that you haven't done that. And I try to do that because like, it's about it being a new thing. It's not, it's not about like skydiving or like you know, learning how to do dressage or something. It's often you're like, Sarah, I can't believe you haven't read like Anna Karenina or something, you know, or like one this year was watch the graduate. I hadn't seen it. <laughs> so I did it, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I find the practice of doing that really interesting because mm -hmm. to me, it's a direct application of living out. You have these ideas. Mm -hmm. It one forces you to make a conscious choice about fun things you want to try. Yeah. And then it keeps you sort of on track, yeah, accountable oh, totally. yeah. to living out those things yeah. that you wanted. And mm -hmm. even if you don't do it all. Yeah. I'm it, still doing some of it. I yeah. always do at least have, and I also have um, a list of it in the sidebar of my blog. So it's public. So like I, you know, kind of quote unquote have to. Kind of public accountability there. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. If someone wanted to make their own list, are yeah. there any tips? If you Google, I wrote a blog post and I think it's called like, why you need a new things practice and how to create one. Okay. And so one of the things that I tell people is like, I would say don't do more than 20, don't make a list more than 25 because people will get really, you know, ambitious and do like a hundred and that's not going to work and you're going to get down on yourself. Um, and so I try to tell them like, it should, you know, it should be something you can complete in a day. It shouldn't be super expensive. It shouldn't be something that requires you to like buy a bunch of new equipment or like train. Um, be honest with your, like, again, it can be totally boring. Like I want to watch that TV show that everybody, like I've never watched the wire find things that are like, just cause it's boring or just cause it's easy. Doesn't mean it shouldn't go on there. Not every single thing on there needs to be like, you know, inventing the wheel. Like it can just be, and like, don't be embarrassed if it's like ride a horse or learn to ride a bike or something that's sort of like basic that other people know how to do. And I try to break mine down into, um, something, I, I don't know if cultural is the right term, but something like movie TV based, a physical challenge, like trying some sort of sport or some sort of activity, usually something food based, um, a few things, like a few things that are skill based. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I always encourage people to involve the people in their life in it because it will create accountability and it will strengthen your friendships.
That's pretty amazing. Yeah. Well, we'll link to that post that you mentioned yes. yeah. in the description of this yeah. podcast and, yeah. and video as well so people can find it for more. When you started your website, your blog, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes and Yes, mm -hmm. what was the inspiration behind that name? Um, honestly, it was just something that I said a lot. People would be like, do you want to get cheese curds or garlic bread? And I'd be like, yes and yes. <laughs> <laughs> like, So it was just something that I said. And I am very thankful that that is the title that I went with. So I didn't like paint myself into a corner by like titling the blog something super niche and then being like, oh God, I want to change this topic. Yeah. Um, and it was also just sort of, you know, it was positive. It was open-ended. I did not know this, but apparently um, like finding a way to say yes is like an improv rule, an improv comedy. Yes, and. Yes, and so like I didn't know that, but since then, you know, multiple improv comedians have said like, oh, that's such a great name. It's such a great like mindset. And I was like, yeah, that's definitely what I was doing on 100 purpose. 100 on purpose. Yep, yes. definitely on purpose. I'm so smart. <laughs> yep. I've never taken an improv class yeah. but i've had friends that have taken it and told me about the yes and rule in mm. that you always are you familiar with this it's like it's the, like you find a way like you don't say you don't shut somebody down you like find a way to build on their idea exactly You're which is always so nice building. that is a great mindset it is not the one i went into my blog <laughs> with but it is a lovely mindset to have it is a lovely mindset you're mm. always giving instead of just saying yes i would like that potato and then yeah. ending the conversation <laughs> yeah. you're like but what about this cheese I have, should yeah. we add? And then you're always building yeah. on the conversation. It That's is really nice, yeah. Cool concept. And and the tagline um, is because yes is more fun than no, which is, you know, something I try to navigate. That's how I try to navigate my life. Like, is there a way that I can say yes to this? You know, when in doubt, I sort of try to choose the bigger life. Like, this is a strange parallel to draw, but my 20-year um, high school reunion is coming up. And... Um, I was, you know, getting up to my hometown and like dealing with like who's taking the car and taking time off in traffic. I was sort of just like, oh, God, I don't know if I want to do this. It seems like a huge hassle. But then I thought, you know, like, yes is more fun than no. Choose the bigger life. Like, I don't, it's not like I have anything on the calendar for that weekend. Like the possibility of going home and reconnecting with people that I grew up with and probably having some really great conversations and seeing my old friends something could come of that, or it could just be a great experience. I'm pretty sure I know how my weekend's going to go if I stay at home. Like I'll have some friends over for brunch, you know, I'll like do some sort of yard project. I might go to a movie, but I don't know what's going to happen if I go to my high school reunion. Some awesome thing could happen. So like, why not just do it? So this is my, I love that. And this is my thing. I'm totally a yes person mm -hmm. and have been for basically my entire life <laughs> yeah. more less so now mm -hmm. and, and i'll explain what that what i mean by that mm -hmm. exactly less so now than i have been in the past mm -hmm. i just i love just being like yes mm -hmm. yeah let's do that yeah yes yeah. i'll do that thing yeah and so many amazing opportunities oh my gosh people yes. Yes. like i'm sure that this conversation is mm -hmm. happening right now because at some point I said yes to a thing, maybe even before we yeah, met. Yeah, like or you even said yes to meeting Grant, who, who told me about you, and then you said yes to meeting me. Exactly. And, mm -hmm. um, and, yeah. and so many amazing things have come into my life because yeah. of just simply showing up and saying yes. Mm -hmm. In the last year or two, I've found that I need to guard yeah. myself a little mm -hmm. bit more because I have... Mm -hmm. break the twitch yeah. i have this very clear kind yeah. of thing mm -hmm. that i'm working on that i'm trying to focus on mm -hmm. and i'm learning that i don't have the just bandwidth yeah. to be mm -hmm. saying yes to everything yeah. anymore and mm -hmm. i don't know how i feel about mm, that yeah one of the biggest compliments that i ever got was a girlfriend who told me that i was the quote queen of boundaries <laughs> So like, I'm not somebody who struggles to say no to requests that I'm not 100% comfortable with. So I would say in my professional life, I am much more likely to be like, no, you can't pick my brain for free. No, I don't want to be part of your telesummit. No, I don't want to jump on the phone with you. You're not a client. Mm -hmm. um, but in my personal life, I am. And I think because I have those boundaries and I 
am intentional with my no saying in my professional life, I have a lot more space to say yes in my personal life. So I can say yes to this high school reunion. I can say yes to, you know, going out to going out to Denver to like see a friend that I haven't seen in years. Or if a friend is going through a hard time and she lives in New York, I can fly out for that. Um, so because I say no occasionally Mm -hmm. in my professional life, to me, that frees up for yes in my personal life. Do you have a cliff notes on boundary making? Oh, If if someone were to ask for your advice. Oh my gosh. Oh, that's hard. Yeah. Um, well, I would say the mantra of your desire to blank is not more important than my desire to blank. Um, and also I think it just, you know, a lot of it just comes trial and error and noticing like when you do something, do you feel resentful? Then make note of that and don't do that stuff again. (laughs) What kind of daily habits might you have? I'm curious. Do you have like a morning routine, evening routine? I have both a morning and an evening routine and they're both like relatively in stone and I feel sort of incomplete if I don't do them, which is, you know, that's the goal, right? Like to have habits that are so strong that you feel weird. Um, so my morning routine, I do not get up to an alarm clock because one of my personal, something that I talk about a lot is, um, how it's important to create your own definition of success. And one of my personal barometers of success is not using an alarm clock. So I don't get up to an alarm clock. Um, and when I get up, I have, um, hot lemon water. Um, and then I have breakfast and I always like put my breakfast like on a real plate and like put it on the table and like eat it on the table. I don't eat it in front of like a TV. Um, and then I make myself a cup of coffee and I read fiction. (laughs) Um, and then I read whatever novel I'm reading until the cup of coffee is gone. And then I get dressed and I take the dog out for a walk. And while I'm walking the dog, I will run the Roomba. So it's like cleaning while I'm walking and the dog's not freaking out about it. And then when I get home, then that's when I check my email and then I move forward with that. Um, And then at the end of my work day, which is pretty much always five, I will um, make myself a fancy drink, which let's be honest, is really like LaCroix with some fruit in it. Like it's not (laughs) even, we're not even like, it's like Trader Joe's LaCroix. I I have to ask like, what's your LaCroix? What's your go-to? I don't, I don't have a, anything that's not coconut. Okay. (laughs) Okay, (laughs) Yeah. I totally like, I'll drink LaCroix. I'll drink Trader Joe's sparkling water. Like I, I do not care. So there's no allegiance here. There is no allegiance. There is no allegiance. But so I usually have like a fancy drink. Like I put it in a highball, you know, with some fruit or herbs or whatever. And then I read and then I go out on the deck and I get my novel again. And I like drink my drink and sit on the deck and read my novel. And then when the drink is done, then like the evening starts. Yeah. It's not about working. I mean, sometimes I'll like, you know, landscape or like clean, but we're not like opening the computer again. Um, and then I'm done with screen time at like nine or nine 30. And before I go to bed, I make, um, I have, it's not even, it's not a fancy planner. It's just a spiral bound notebook. And I list three things that I'm grateful for. And then I make a list of five things that I want to do the next day. And of those things, usually three things are like kind of big stuff. One thing is fun because I'm pretty type A. And if I don't put a fun thing on my list, I'll just like work myself into the ground. Um, And one thing is like an incredibly, it's like an easy win, you know, like do laundry. Because like some of the things might be like finish that pitch or like write a chapter for that book you're ghostwriting. Mm -hmm. That's huge obviously. And so it's usually like three significant things, one fun thing, and then one like incredibly like go drop your shoes off at the cobbler. Yeah. It's an easy win. Uh, and that's, and then I go to bed and I read my novel in bed again and then that's it. That's it. That's the, that's that's, the bookends. Yep. Those are my routines. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's great. Mm -hmm. It's interesting that you have that structure Mm -hmm. working from home. Yeah. uh, As Amy and I have been doing now since October, Mm -hmm. we found various challenges, Mm -hmm. especially working in the same space as each other all day. Oh my gosh. Um, Oh, you see, there's one desk here. There's another desk here. Yeah. And, and then also creating that list of like a fun thing to do because in a very similar vein, we, we also 
don't wake up to an alarm mm-hmm. generally. Yeah. Which is kind of our thing. It's yeah. it's our what's our little definition yeah. of success. Mm-hmm. And so we're not waking up to an alarm, but there are a lot of nights where we're up till two or three working oh, on something. Wow. So yeah. we'll sleep in sometimes till nine. Mm-hmm. Um, it, uh, you know, it's it really varies for us. So it mm-hmm. looks a little weird if you don't have that fun thing on the calendar, like, oh, I really want to try this restaurant or yeah. do this thing. Mm-hmm. We just end up kind of oh my god, yeah, working on stuff. Okay, yeah. eat something in the kitchen and then yeah. come back, and then our evening yeah. is gone. It might sound like it's oh well, you can just yeah do it whenever you want. Yeah, but it, it, it just... expand when you're self-employed. Like your work expands to fill your life. Like it, it will take yeah. as much space as you give it. Like there's always more to do. Always. So something that I have done, I have to work very hard to not let perfect be the enemy of good because I will like shine and polish something for like seven months. So something that I've been doing is giving myself a time limit and say like, Sarah, you can work on this for five hours and then it's done. Or like you have two hours and then you're publishing this because otherwise I will work on it for seven hours. And the difference between how good it is at seven hours and how good it is at two hours no one will notice. <laughs> you, you're such a good writer. You've been writing for so long yeah. and it's like, yeah, you, you're probably there. Yeah. Nobody's going to notice. Nobody's yeah. going to notice. Yeah. But I'm going to make myself crazy and I'm going to put less into the world because I'm so busy polishing something that nobody, you know, is going to notice the difference. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Creating that yeah. structure is, is tough. Mm-hmm. I used to have very different views about this work. Mm-hmm. When I was working at Nice Ride full time, mm-hmm. I don't know if you've had the same experience, but when I was working at Nice Ride full time, I thought, mm-hmm. man, YouTubers have it so good. <laughs> sure. Like they just upload videos. They can do it from wherever yeah. they mm-hmm. want. Mm-hmm. And this is some of the most challenging work I think I've done yeah. in terms of getting out consistent videos that I'm, yeah. I'm proud of and mm-hmm. Amy and I are working together on this and, yeah. and really wanting to create things of value. Mm-hmm. And then there's all this pressure yeah. behind that even concept of, yeah. am I creating, am I helping people actually? Yes. And yeah. is this helpful? Is this the best I can do right now? Yeah. And it just goes into this deep, dark thing of, of like, oh yeah, totally. Whoa. Every now and then it's kind mm-hmm. of this uh, feeling of, Whoa, whoa. Okay. Yeah. Oh, totally. We need yeah. to back up and view this more holistically again. Yeah. Oh, totally. And I mean, like, they can't all be home runs. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I've published yeah. 2,000 blog posts. I'm sure there are some stinkers in there. <laughs> I mean, one or I'm two sh- bad ones. Yeah. Maybe? Clearly, there are some stinkers in there. <laughs> I have, and I think we've probably talked about this, I have um, a file in my email folder, very cleverly titled Smile File. <laughs> And anytime anybody sends me a nice email, I put it in there. So then when I'm having like a dark night of the soul of like, what's the point even? <laughs> I, I will go read those yeah. because I have gotten plenty of emails. And I'm sure you have too, of people literally saying this has changed my life. I have plenty of those emails. I'm sure you get plenty of those emails. And so anytime I'm feeling like I need to polish something for seven hours or like, is this even going to make a difference? I can go back and look at all of these emails, people saying like, your advice helped me get my dream job. Or like, you helped me pay off $10,000 worth of credit card debt. Or like, your course saved my marriage. That's That will really help. It helps me get over myself and be like, oh my God, just push publish, Sarah. It's fine. Yeah. That's a great mm-hmm. idea to compile some of yeah. that in an easy to access place. Mm-hmm. I can tell you that that is any amount that I've helped anyone that's yeah. ever watched a video, read a blog post, mm-hmm. any of the work I've done and getting something yeah. from it and just letting me know is the most yeah. fulfilling thing oh my for gosh, me yes. of all of this. Yeah. So if any of you guys yeah. are watching, <laughs> email your favorite bloggers and tell them that their work is helpful. <laughs> Cause they wonder. Yeah. They're oh wondering. my gosh. Yes. We are humans. Yeah. I mean, and so I, because it is such a positive experience for me when people do that, I try really hard to pay it forward and reach out to the people whose work has been helpful to me and say like, you know, I really appreciate your transparency about this or like, you know, that tip that you gave was so helpful. I try to be really open and honest and forthcoming um, with people whose work has been helpful to me because I know how much it means to me when people do that. Yeah. So what are some things that you're excited about right now? You're working on Ooh. what, what's, what's hot and, and new? Um, well, I would say the thing that I am most excited about is, so I have, um, three online courses and I've had, and I've been running them 
for about like two, I think two years, year and a half, two years. And I was sort of following the model that a lot of online course creators use, which is, you know, there's a webinar, there's a evergreen webinar, you sign up for it. It's hour long. The last 20 minutes is like a pitch with expiring bonuses. You sign up, you buy the course, it's self-paced, and then you put yourself through the course. Um, so that's the like model that I was using. Cause that's what I saw everybody else doing. Um, and if you guys have ever taken an online course, the people who create your course, they can go in and see how much you've done. <laughs> like, so I can yes. look and see that probably 70% of people who buy this course, who buy my courses are not completing them. I felt really bad about that. And then I Googled and I found out that 90% yes. of people- I was people, like 70, that's amazing. a great yeah. statistic. Yeah. So that made me feel, uh, it made me feel not so bad about myself, but mostly made me feel like, um, what the F are we doing as an industry? Because like, can you imagine somebody trying to sell you a blender that didn't work 90% of the time? Like that's so unethical. Mm -hmm. So the last time I ran, um, one of my courses called bank boost, which is what's, what's my motto. I think it's like a no deprivation approach to spending less and earning more. Um, and I ran it live. Um, and so that meant mm. that I, there were weekly emails. There was a Facebook group that we were all in every day. There were like three live Q and A's. There was accountability where at the beginning of the week, I would ask people a question in the Facebook group. They would respond. And then on Sunday night, I would tag them to see if they did it. <laughs> Isn't that, but I always told them like, I'm going to do this. So don't take part in this. If you don't want me to tag you right. on this Sunday night. This is what you're opting in for. Yes. For this. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. And so when I did that, so when people did it self-paced, they were bringing in like an extra two to $300. When I did it live, people brought in $1,500. Somebody brought in 7,000 extra dollars. Wow. So okay. if, you, if you run the numbers on that, they improved their results by, I think this is right, 2,300% by me doing it live. And the extra work that I had to put in, it was pretty minimal. Like I checked the Facebook group like once a day and spent like 10 minutes replying to stuff. And then I spent three hours over the course of six weeks, like doing Facebook lives, but the results for them were insane. And so I am going to be running all of my courses live at least once a year. And the other thing it was, is like, I'm so happy that it brought them better you know, results. It was really fun for me. Like, yeah. it's fun for me to like see them in real time being like, oh my gosh, like I did this thing. And then, you know, there's like 45 likes and everybody putting like high five gifts and stuff like that's wonderful. And so I think the thing that's most exciting to me is that I am doing something that makes me happy. And it happens to coincide with being helpful to my students. And I so deeply believe in the work that I'm doing. So knowing like, this is fun for me. It's going to help you. It's going to effing change your life. Like that's just a win, win, win. And I, when I, I wrote about this recently and I sort of joked, not joked that like I was going to get like disbarred from the internet person association <laughs> because uh, people don't like, running live classes. Everybody wants passive income. Right. And I'm totally like the odd person out who's like kind of calling on my peers being like, I don't think it's very fair that you're charging somebody $1,500 for a course that they're unlikely using. Yeah. So just waiting to get some mean emails. <laughs> <laughs> but I've also gotten tons of positive response from like the people who are buying these courses. Like when I talked about this, there were tons of people in the comments being like, yeah, I bought your, put your money where your happiest course. And I'm only 3% done. And I'm like, okay, that's cool. Wait until November when we run the live course and you'll get all the support and accountability you need. Yeah. So I would say that's what I'm excited about because it makes me proud of, you know, living in my values and also makes me excited to help people get awesome results. And also like, honestly, I really like it. It's really fun. So that's what I'm excited about. That's great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. The the difference between a live course, you're mm -hmm. there and engaged. It's so much of what I think it's what I want. Mm -hmm. If I'm buying something like that, yeah. I, I think it's what people in general want. Mm -hmm. uh, that's where I've been focusing my time with Break the Twitch too. I have, I have an ebook that mm -hmm. I put out in the Audible audio book, mm -hmm. but in general, where we're going from here is is like member community. 
Mm-hmm. And we're going to have audio mm. series oh, nice. within that community mm-hmm. that you just have access to yeah. if you're part of it. And mm-hmm. so you can go through and do the stuff. It's exactly for that reason yeah. is that I did a course two years ago mm-hmm. and I saw the numbers on it mm-hmm. and they were, like you said, they were better than mm-hmm. the industry standard completion yeah. rates, but I just didn't want to feel like I was charging yeah. money for something that people wouldn't get through. I want yeah. the change. I, you know, yeah. the money just helps me keep yeah. making this stuff. Yeah. So, yeah. so, uh, in the end, that's where we're trying to go. Mm-hmm. And, and so I get it and, and I'm glad that you're doing that. I saw that yeah. I got that email. And <laughs> so, um, glad to hear that, that that's what you're doing. That's yeah. what's exciting. It feels good. Yeah. What is your take on the idea of creativity? Ooh, gosh. Um, I feel like, Creativity is um, a skill that you can strengthen and develop. I know that a lot of people sort of have a narrative that like, I'm not creative. Ideas don't come easily to me, but I think it's something that anybody can have. Anybody can develop. It's just a matter of um, finding what works for you and what sparks creativity for you. Cause it's not the same for everybody. Um, and also like not believing like the people I know who believe they're not creative are people who maybe like work in like science or tech and they have maybe their teachers, maybe their peers, somehow they've gotten the message that like they're not creative and they're not capable of those, you know, of creative thoughts. But I think that's total BS. I think that Agreed. anybody, and also like creativity is not just like, I had a cool idea for a painting. You know, you can, it's also about like having creative problem solving for some issue at work. Like, I designed this really innovative string of code. Like that is creative. It's not just about like being a sculptor. Like there are so many ways to be creative. So I think don't limit yourself by believing you're not creative or that you can't be creative because, you know, you have a more technical mindset. I think everybody can be creative. Um, I have found that the more often I'm away from screens and the more often I move my body, I'm creative. Like, the vast majority of my best ideas have come while I'm walking. They don't usually come to me while I'm like watching Netflix and eating pizza rolls. That's just me. Maybe some people are creative then, but like, I, I remember when I got the idea for my blog, I was on a hike on the superior hiking trail. Like I can see the section of trail in my mind's eye, Mm -hmm. like when I had the idea for the blog. Um, so I would say, don't count yourself out from being creative. And if you're struggling to find creative ideas, um, Turn off your screen and get outside and move your body. Yeah. There's such an unfortunate situation with the fact that I cannot remember where or who (laughs) I saw this or said this, but it's so brilliant. And if anyone knows where this quote comes from, please (laughs) tell me. But there is an author who said, whenever I need to write a book, Mm -hmm. I just make my life increasingly boring until a book comes out. Oh my God, that's so good. So, oh my God, that's so good. Right? And that is exactly what I had to do to write my book too. Yeah. As long as there was something else that was easier and more entertaining, probably, than sitting and writing 2,000 words that day. Oh, yeah. I would, it would I oh had gosh, such yes. a hard time, but as soon yeah. as I cleared all of the clutter out, cleared yeah. all this, the crap, yeah. the writing came. Oh my flowed. gosh. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. and well, and you probably know this, but I do a monthly writing retreat where I do the bulk of my writing in like two days. Um, and I wrote my entire habits course. So I almost always go to the same Airbnb. It is a goat farm in Wisconsin. You guys, <laughs> if you, if you go on Airbnb and look up Chippewa Falls, you will find it. It's amazing. It's a llama and goat farm and they do not have Wi-Fi. Um, and so I go there and I just write in Google docs. I leave my phone in the car and because there's nothing to do other than look out the window and look at goats and you can only do that for so long. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, truly that is, there's nothing else to do other than look at the screen and look at goats and you'd be amazed how much you can accomplish when there's no dishes to do. There are no emails to respond to. It's just you and your cursor. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Just make yourself bored until yeah. bored enough until a book comes yeah. out or something mm-hmm. like that. That's mm-hmm. great. Well, I think it's time for the question bowl. Now, <laughs> these are questions that have been contributed by previous guests, mm-hmm. awesome people in the Break the Twitch community. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then Amy and I came up with a couple oh, to fun. get things started. Awesome. So if you want to grab that, 
we can go ahead and pull. And I, just, I just pull one out of there? You can pull from anywhere Ooh. in there. It's, there yep. It's always smart to go for the, bu the, Ooh, the right. ones tucked yeah. away. Okay. So if you want to just go ahead and read that question, let's see what we got. <gasps> oh my gosh. What is the biggest mix misconception about your career, lifestyle, or job? Ooh, YouTube viewer Cass, 9 of 47. Okay. Oh Cass, gosh. Thank you for the question. Oh, oh my gosh. There are many misconceptions about my career, lifestyle, and job. Um, but I would say the one that most closely relates to what we've been talking about is that I slash you, um, need to make an insane amount of money to have the life that you want. Like in this spirit of transparency, I believe that talking about money is a gift to everybody around you. So I'm going to tell you guys that I make high sixties, low seventies, which is like, you know, that's a nice amount of money, but it's not. You know, I'm not making $450,000 a year. Like I make a, a comfortable living. Um, but I travel all the time to places that I'm really excited about. I, you know, have a car that I really like that has like a backup camera that I paid for in cash. <laughs> a backup camera, you guys. <laughs> um, and I have, you know, like we live in a cute house full of cute furniture with like great, you know, woodwork. <laughs> like I have a, a really nice life and I make a totally normal amount of money. And the reason that I have that nice life is because I have spent with intention. So I would say the biggest misconception about my lifestyle is most people wildly overestimate how much money I make hmm. because when they look at our house or the photos that I post on Instagram or, you know, my car, they would expect that I make a lot more, but you probably need less money than you think to have the life that you want. Wow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's a big one. So where can people find you online? What are the sure. main places or the places you want people to go? Um, the main place is my blog, which is yesandyes.org. Um, I am pretty active on Instagram. My handle is yes and yes blog. And, um, I have a very active private Facebook group that is wonderful. It's called, um, more money, more happy. Um, and you can just find it on, um, if you just Google it in Facebook, it's like 3,700 people full wow, of, yeah. and they're so sweet to each other. And like, they'll post, you know, like I did this thing and it was awesome. And like 75 people like it and they give each other tons of good advice. And it's a really fun place to hang out. So I'd say, Yes and yes.org on Instagram at yes and yes blog and in my private Facebook group, Money and Happy. Fantastic. Well, thanks so much for joining me. And I just, it was a pleasure to, to have you here for the chat. Oh, well, thank you so much for having me. As always, I'd like to highlight one of the major takeaways I had from this conversation with Sarah. But first, as you probably know, reviews are absolutely essential to getting the word out about a podcast like this one. So if you've been enjoying these episodes, I would greatly appreciate it if you just took a moment to leave a review on Apple Podcasts. It would be a huge help and mean the world to me. So one of the things that really stuck out to me about the conversation with Sarah was the parallels of money and action. When I talk about Break the Twitch, I talk about living out and aligning our actions with our values because a lot of the time the twitch or those little things we do are not actually aligned with the values we hold. But when Sarah brought it into the money perspective, talking about why are we not spending our money in ways that make us happier, even if they are very inexpensive, but really making sure to align our money with our values, I couldn't help but see the similarity. If you think about it, money is something that we go out into the world, work, and largely earn. And so in a way, that money is representative of our time. Each dollar we spend is just a dollar that we worked for and gave away some time for. So although it's indirect, the way we spend our money really is tied to our actions. And so, of course, those actions, to the best of our ability, should be tied to our values. So we really can look at money as a personal finance perspective on this and see that we can change the way that we spend little amounts of money each day 
the coffee, if that does make you happy, you can embrace it. If you value the conversations you have over a coffee, you can 100% embrace that. But realize that that is something you're doing that aligns with your values. Whereas there might be small gadgets or other little things that maybe you don't really need and don't really align with how you want to be spending your time or your money. And then you can make those changes.